Michelle Dubois, your state representative, one of three here in Brockton. I'm here today um, with Good Government with Michelle Dubois. It's a cable access show that I do monthly, but since COVID hit back in March of 2020, I have not done it. And this is my first time back in the studio. And today I am here with City Councilor Susan DeCastro and Kirsty Petchy from uh, Conservation Law Foundation. And we are here to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is sewer sludge. I, I get into garbage, sewer sludge, anti-power plant efforts, and the environment. And so um, I was, it was brought to my attention by Councilor Nicastro um, that the city's DPW was suggesting a process called pyrolysis, and I'm saying it wrong. And it is a high heat type of um, response to dealing with our sewage sludge. Right now, our, go, it go, our wastewater goes through our wastewater treatment plant and it goes, um, we truck it down to Connecticut and it gets incinerated. Because around five years ago, we closed the city's incinerator, which was a big effort on our part to um, make sure our air was cleaner. And um, when I heard that the city's DPW was proposing this pyrolysis, I looked into it and um, found that it's just another term for incineration in my opinion. High heat, lots of air pollution, and so we met with the city and we were able to talk to the mayor and he had a better understanding of what the DPW was suggesting and Mayor Sullivan um, has put a stop to that proposal. But that doesn't mean that we don't have to find a solution um, to our, our wastewater sewer sludge, our fecal matter. What do we do with it? Where does it go? And so um, we're launching this effort to communicate more with our residents to come up with a plan that you can uh, support and that you like and that won't pollute us or make us sick and today I've asked um, Kirsty to come here, Attorney Petchy, and talk a little bit more because she's an expert in the field about what pyrolysis is, the dangers of it, and some of the issues around um, handling wastewater. So what we're going to do is I'm going to have uh, Ward 4 City Council Susan Castro introduce herself, and then Kirsty will talk a little bit about um, her background, Conservation Law Foundation, and, and a little bit of the dangers. And then we're going to get into a broad conversation about wastewater treatment. Thank you for joining us. Susan? Thank you. I am Susan DeCastro. I represent Ward 4 on the Brockton City Council. It is my fifth year, my third term, the beginning of my third term. And um, I, 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 I love what I do. I, I love doing this work at this time in my life and my career. Um, Ward 4, as many of us know, is burdened by several environmental challenges. We are the home of the way of the wastewater treatment plant, which is down on Oak Hill Way on the banks of the Salisbury Plain River. We're also the home of the landfill, which is on Thatcher Street. Over the years, and I've lived here more than 30 years, these two entities have resulted in terrible odors in Ward 4 at different times. And the wastewater treatments plant's odors were generated primarily from when it incinerated solid sludge which was the result of the processing that it, that it does. Um, five years ago, we took down our incinerator and we began trucking the sludge to an incinerator in Connecticut. And that seemed to solve it for us. We spend about two and a half million dollars a year to do this. Um, but it's not a perfect solution because the EPA wants to close all incinerators in the state. I'm sorry, in the country. And so at a certain point, we have to find a more permanent solution to dealing with our sludge. And when this came up at the council, it was in order to borrow $35 million to make changes to the plant. I looked into it further and, dis and discovered that they wanted to put in dryers for the sludge and this new technology, pyrolosis, which would uh, cook it at high heats and turn it into ash. We asked Attorney Pesci to come down and talk to us. She is an expert in these things. She heads up the Zero Waste Project for all of the New England region at the Conservation Law Foundation. And I'm so interested to hear what she has to say. Kirsty. Well, thank you so much for having me, Representative and Counselor. I really appreciate your time. Uh, and I really appreciate your focusing on these issues. Uh, while we don't know all of the details regarding this proposal, uh, you know, which may already be dead in the water, but you know, it's, it sounds like it still might be an issue, uh, 
we do know that uh, these facilities, pyrolysis facilities, which we all say differently, but we all mean the same thing. Uh, these pyrolysis facilities are, we are really the same across the board in a lot of ways. Um, they're incinerators, according to EPA, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency at the federal government defines them as incinerators. Uh, they are uh, polluting, they take a lot of fossil fuels to run, uh, and they create toxic ash that then needs to be disposed of. So it's not great that you're sending it down to Connecticut, but this opportunity would be the worst solution because it would burden your community. One thing that I get asked a lot is, you know, oh, so do people hire CLF? Are you consultants? Are you know, are, work as a regular law firm? Just no. A Conservation Law Foundation works throughout New England. It's a nonprofit organization, meaning that we get donations. Please feel free to send us some donations to uh, to do our work from foundations, from individuals. Uh, and what we then do is we choose what are the projects we're going to work on, and we do that by first of all what we have the capacity to do, but also promoting the best solutions and discouraging or actively fighting the worst ideas. And this falls into that category. So we're fighting, if this moves forward, we will fight this facility. We are also fighting a proposed sewage sludge incinerator in Taunton, Massachusetts for the same reason. Um, because we don't want to see environmental justice communities burdened by toxic emissions, toxic ash, and uh, expensive bills to pay, and very few jobs being created. There are better solutions to deal with your sludge, and I'm so glad that both of you are trying to figure them out. We welcome your help. Yes, thank you so much. And we'll get into a conversation uh, about it. Just so folks understand, because I get this question a lot, um, I work on, I'm, I'm working on this issue here, and then also, for instance, the city of Taunton has a similar proposal yes, from Aries. Yes. Um, the reason that I you know, drive an hour and a half to come down here and talk to you folks about this and, and make myself available and try and give you all the research we've got from across the country on these issues is because we're concerned about the safety, we're concerned about the public health impact. Uh, CLF does not get paid or recruited to work on certain projects. We look at what's happening in the region and we look at what is uh, safe and what works and what you know creates jobs and is good for local economies, we support that stuff. And then we look at the opposite, which is what this is. And when it's dangerous enough, we show up. Unfortunately, there are a lot of projects I'm concerned about throughout the region, you know, of New England, that we don't have enough time or money to put into and to you know actually work on. We our our donors are very generous and the foundations are very generous, but there's only so many hours in the day. Right. So the fact that I'm here is because I'm concerned. This is a priority for me because this is dangerous. Well, I have to say I agree. I'm very concerned as well. Um, like five years ago, I was overjoyed when we were able to get the city to close its waste incinerator. Up until then, we had been burning our poop right over our heads and we all breathe it in and all the chemicals and the pharmaceuticals and the PFAS and everything that comes with the air pollution. So when we closed that down, um, you know, I was really happy that we were, we were reaching forward to positive ways to handle our waste. And um, the city determined, and I, I agree with it or not, the city determined that they were going to handle the waste by shipping it to Connecticut to put in an incinerator. And um, that incinerator has been open for many years, and it incinerates a lot of waste, and you've got to feed the beast once it's created. And so a lot of companies and, and municipalities bring their waste there to be incinerated. And whenever I heard about this um, paralysis, Pyrolysis. Pyrolysis. Pyrolysis yeah. technology. I'm probably saying it incorrectly too. I Google searched it, and every time it came up, it came up with the words incineration, comma gasification, comma paralysis. And I know, as a non-expert, that incineration is bad and gasification is bad. And gasification, for a long time, um, was tried. Uh, they tried to pitch it to us as it was a positive, um, and now they're trying to pitch this pyro 
pyrolysis as a positive. When I know it's just a different form of incineration because the heat gets up to 1700 degrees. So when I first heard about this happening like a month ago, I spoke with um, Councilor Nicastro about it and I spoke with, I called the mayor and I texted with them, we communicated and um, he, he, up until that point, no one had brought up the high heat number to him. No one had used the word gasification or incineration. And, I, I, and he's like, well, maybe there's a miscommunication. And sometimes there is in government, the bureaucracy, Absolutely. you're not sure. Um, and I said to him, I said, well, I think once we clarify the confusion, you are going to be opposed to this. And so when I went to the meeting that Susan referred to on a couple Fridays ago, um, the mayor started out the meeting with the comments that I will not be putting any type of incineration in Ward 4. So our Mayor Sullivan is not, he's committed to not doing that okay. and that he was putting a hold on this whole thing. Um, there were a lot of steps more to go um, for this to become a reality and we'll hear from from Kirsty that sometimes these projects get all the way down the pipeline, they can't even get the financing. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I, I had a lot of bad feelings about this idea. And so I reached out to Conservation Law Foundation as a, they're just an honest broker from my point of view about what happens in the environment. They're smart enough to see through the greenwashing. And for you at home that don't know what greenwashing is, greenwashing is when an industry or a group comes up with the word or redefines a word or terminology and says that it's good for the environment. So they'll say that burning trees is good for the environment because it's renewable because you can grow more trees. But you can't grow a 30-year-old tree, 30 year old tree a 300-year-old tree, mm -hmm. and it's not going to clean the air as much, so it's not renewable. That's greenwashing. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get to the, to the nuts and bolts of how pyrolysis and this high heat technology is is greenwashing really and it's not good for us and it's not the way we should go um, when they talked about it sometimes what you're going to hear if this crops up again everybody at home you're going to hear that it's going to save the city money and I did the numbers we have a 550 something million dollar budget and they tell everybody that it's going to save the city a million dollars a year and you can do the percentages there that's very small for the amount of um, air pollution and problems um, in their application to the state um, CDM wrote um, that the problem that they were trying to solve was the truck trips through the city that bring the waste to Connecticut to be incinerated and if the diesel from the truck truck trips is what they're supposed to be solving one solution would be to buy electric trucks and then put out the bid to manage our waste with electric trucks that we own as a city. But I don't even really think that that, that's, a, I mean, the application was, was kind of shocking in what it didn't say, because then there was a section that said, what are the environmental hazards? And they said, there are none. And, and so there's a lot of stuff going back and forth. So maybe we can talk a little bit about um, what the hazards from something like this mm -hmm. would be and measure in um, after it's built, how we have to feed that beast. Well, before we do that, let me just add a little bit yeah. more background, okay? Um, as Rep Dubois said, for many years, the city incinerated the sludge that was generated by the wastewater treatment plant. And we in Ward 4 knew when this was happening because our air just smelled horrible. There was such a stench in our air. And you would add that to this, the uh, odors that were coming from the landfill, which is on Thatcher Street. And we had a very smelly ward. It was really horrible how Ward 4 was dumped on for these city uses. Um, so five years ago, in part because of air monitoring that was placed on top of the Gilmore School um, with Rep Dubois' help, we, we learned that we had to stop incinerating because our air was a mess. Um, and so we ceased running our incinerator and we started trucking it to Naugatuck, Connecticut to be incinerated, giving someone else our problem, if you will. And we understand that the EPA in, in Washington frowns on incinerating. And as time goes on, they're wanting all incinerators to be closed the impacts of air pollution are known as time goes on, thank goodness. So one day, Connecticut will no longer accept our sludge for incinerating. We know that day will come, we don't know when. I've done a lot of research. 
on the whisper that, oh, that day is coming soon. I'm not sure when it's coming. But we know in Brockton that we have to deal with our sludge problem. We have to find a plan B and make it our own. So what some people in city government, and they started working on it at least in 2018, according to filings with the Department of Environmental Protection, they came up with this process as, as maybe being our solution. But as we do more research, maybe it's not, or maybe we need to look more. Now, the good thing is, if there is a good thing, every community has this challenge. Every community has to figure out what to do with their sludge. So take it away and let's talk about ways of handling sludge. Sludge is difficult. You know, trash mm -hmm. is a lot easier because a lot of trash is food and cardboard and containers and things that we can compost and recycle or reduce entirely. Um, sludge is difficult because the sludge, you remember, your wastewater and anything that you put down your sink or your toilet or your um, runoff, you know, stormwater runoff, all ends up at your wastewater treatment plant. Unfortunately, one of the problems is that that includes industrial materials. So, for instance, if there's landfill leachate from your closed landfill, which there probably is, yep. and I haven't checked this, but assuming there is, that leachate is going into your wastewater treatment plant. Mm -hmm. If you have a hospital, if you have uh, hazardous materials, you know, any toxics, they're going to go into that system. That's really the crux of the problem. The wastewater treatment plant is set up to deal with biological material, to deal with fecal matter. So it can stop us from having, uh, you know, a problem with, say, cholera or, you know, uh, or um, too much uh, phosphorus or nitrogen in water bodies. Like, that's what the wastewater treatment plant does well. And it's excellent that it does that, and it's a very important technology. But we don't have, it, it does not have the capacity to treat, and you had said this before, it doesn't have the capacity to treat any of these toxics. Mm. So when I talk about the chemicals that are in sewage sludge, because those are the chemicals that stick to the solids, right? To the to the, the poop, literally, and other thing, any other solid piece, you know, a wipe or you know, uh, cigarette butts or whatever else is going down the sewer system. Parakeet. Parakeet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hope not, but a I goldfish. A goldfish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, you know, picture the teenage mutant ninja turtles. Those guys. That's what they right. were seeing every day. Mm -hmm. right. That is going into your sewer treatment plant. Unfortunately. The um, chemicals, that, and a lot of the, these chemicals are really resistant to being broken down. Uh, they're chemicals of emerging concern, we call them. The chemicals that stick in our bodies and are really poisonous to us, uh, those are very difficult to eradicate, and those are definitely in the sewage sludge. The one that gets talked about a lot is PFAS. Yes. Yeah. So PFAS isn't a chemical. It's not like lead. Right? Though, and remember, heavy metals and all that is in the sewage sludge too. Plastic is in the sewage sludge. But PFAS is a family of tens of thousands right. of chemicals, okay? Uh, volatile organic compounds, PCB, like there's literally tens of thousands of chemicals. And the wastewater treatment plant does not treat them. So they either go off in the gas, adhere to the sludge, or go out the, the outflow pipe into the water. That sludge, therefore, as I said, plastics, PFAS, it, heavy metals, you name it, it's in there. And so one of the problems with that, we're understanding that PFAS, the family of PFAS chemicals, and it's perfluoroalkyde substances, which I'm probably pronouncing incorrectly myself. But so that family of chemicals is very, very toxic to human beings. And the whole point of it, it was it made firefighter foam. It made you know it was used for nonstick pans, water repellent, water repellent, mm -hmm. uh, exactly. Gore yeah, it's used for grease repellent in in um, cardboard takeout containers. Mm -hmm. It's used a lot because it works really well. It doesn't break down right. under high heat. I mean that's why they made firefighter foam out of it. So as a result, it's in the sewage sludge. In, even if it's in very small amounts, that's really toxic to human beings. There's not a safe amount, as far as we can figure out, of PFAS chemicals. And there are so many different ones. So what we've seen is now the sewage sludge, if it had lower levels of contaminants, lower levels of toxics, 
it got spread on land as fertilizer. I was against yeah. this from the beginning. I it's want everybody at home too. to know me. the second I heard it, I knew it was yeah. greenwashing yeah. that we could just take our poop and spread it on a field we, and make millions of dollars well, we on could, it. We could have if we made sure there weren't any toxics exactly. in it. Exactly. Yeah. And we don't even test it for a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's the thing to remember. The NIPTES permit, the national permit that the, that the wastewater treatment plant has doesn't test for this stuff in the water and the sewage sludge. So what happened is now in Maine, they've banned that entirely because there are huge areas of farmland that no longer are safe. Right. The animals have been dying, the crops are no good. Right. They can't eat the deer in Maine in some places. We had this happen in West Bridgewater where they were yeah. spreading this all down and yeah. saying it was agricultural land so they could do it and now they can't grow a thing so, on the land. So there's two million acres in this country that are befouled and ruined by this. So, so that's the toxic substance we're talking about. It's complicated, it's very toxic, and even when the levels are really, really low, almost uh, undetectable, they're dangerous to people. Well, it's funny you say that because one of my very smart residents in Ward 4 called me last, last Wednesday, June 1st. She couldn't come to our meeting, but she said, you know, Susan, the Milwaukee wastewater treatment plant in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, mm -hmm does this process and markets what's left over mm -hmm. in fertilizer and you can buy it in the big box stores. That's right. It's called Mills, I'm sorry, Mills something. Yeah, no, yeah, that's but exactly correct. But they're cutting correct. that out. I, I, well, I've so, been reading so, articles that they're cutting yeah, that so out. So Greater Lawrence Sanitary District takes food and puts the food in with the sewage sludge and processes it that way, gets some, you know, and the Arab Digester gets some energy and then what's left over, Casella was making it into fertilizer. And Sierra Club did a study and said that fertilizer is not safe. It, it's got PFAS in it. So, so this is the substance we're talking about. And, so here, and here's the other piece of this. So then you get to high heat technologies. As the rep very clearly stated, incineration, uh, pyrolysis, gasification, it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it's a duck. Right. Okay? So if you have, and, and this is, and the EPA also, just so you know, the EPA, um, EPA defines pyrolysis, gasification, and these high heat technologies as incineration. So of course people know that, you know, companies know, nobody likes incinerators. Right? Everybody knows now because yeah. that was greenwashing at yeah, one point exactly. too. That right. was, right, in the 70s. Um, so because of that they say, oh no, 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 this is not an incinerator. Okay, it, it, what it is is staged combustion. So the sludge is very wet and heavy. Right, because it's right. You know, just you know, screened out of it's the wastewater. Poop. It's right. our poop, right? So it's all it's screened out. Um, it then has to be dried. Now there's emissions from the drying. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's PFAS Oxidizing. and other things that dry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Good point. So that's coming out. Then after it's dried, which is very energy intensive, by the yeah. way. Yeah. So after it's dried, uh, then they heat it at very high temperatures. Pyrolysis means no air. Gasification means some air, paralysis means no air. That's the difference between the technologies. It's more complicated than that, but generally speaking, that's mm -hmm. why they call one, 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 the other. So paralysis, it's heated without air, and then it breaks down into different substances that are then burned. Synthetic gas, uh, you know, oils, waxes, other things, and then it's burned, and then you're left with ash. Now, there's a few different things to understand about that. First of all, that ash, they're calling it char and they're saying that it's clean. Um, you know, the, the really chances knows. of it being, well, no, we do know it's not. I, there's, right. I've, never, I, I've questioned companies from around the country when they've come to CLF and said, we have a technology that's better than everybody else's technology. And I would say, great, show me the tests on your char, on your ash. And every time they haven't tested for a whole ream of chemicals that I know are probably there. Because if you burn, uh, if you burn plastic, which there's a lot of plastic in the sludge, you end up with dioxin. The heavy metals are there, the PFAS is there, et cetera, et cetera. And those things don't break down. They're sometimes created by that process. And in so, the proposal out of the DEP that is now dead because the mayor put a hold on it, but the proposal out of the DPW, not the DEP, the city's DPW, mm -hmm. was to take that ash and keep it 
at the city's landfill right next to the wastewater treatment plant, which I, I couldn't even believe that that was their solution because part of the value of closing the incinerator was stopping the stockpile of this toxic ash right there in Ward 4. Well, that's one of the reasons, and this is what happens to EJ communities like Brockton, right. one of the reasons you're attractive to this company is because you have a landfill where they can bury the ash. And they'll say they're not going to open up the landfill, but you've got a lined set place and they'll start stacking it there. And you've already got it in place right there next to it. Right. So, so that's one piece. The ash is going to be toxic. The emissions, you know, there's emissions, as we said, from the drying. Of there's emissions from the high heat process, you know, without, you know, and then there's emissions from the burning of each stage. Uh, right now, there is no evidence that PFAS disappears. There's this idea that if you burn something at a high enough heat, it's going, you know, it's going to disappear. That's not true. We know that the EPA has not, not only has the EPA said this is safe for destroying PFAS, that there's some way to destroy it all the time, it consistently works, but also the EPA has said that there aren't clear ways to measure the uh, PFAS. In other words, we don't have protocols to measure PFAS from the stack. In Massachusetts, I talked to the DEP, they don't have a plan for how you'd measure the emissions from the stack. That's very scary. You shouldn't build a facility and then afterwards say, oh, this is how we're going to measure what your emissions are. And this is happening nowhere in Massachusetts it as has of not, now. No, but in Taunton, they want to do the same yes. thing. Yes. Right. So, so with this garbage. is garbage. It's garbage. No, no, it's sewage sludge. It's with sewage? Yes, okay. exactly. So, and this is what's very concerning. So that's one thing, is that the, we don't know how to measure the emissions for certain chemicals like PFAS. We don't know, and we have no evidence that they're actually going to be broken down. In fact, we think the PFAS, will, the larger chains will be broken down to smaller chains, which are more easily absorbed into your body. And then the ash, again, is toxic. So for so. people at home, that would mean, this is me speaking as your state representative and a caring resident with asthma, that would mean we would have our poop at high heat and the the emissions coming off of it would have this dangerous PFAS chemical so small that we can breathe it in. So we'll be burning other people's poop from all over well, over our heads. Well, and well, so like that if that's if, if we, was if poop, we if were it was to poop, regionalize be, it. If it was poop I wouldn't be worried. Well, with it, the chemicals. But that's but it's because of the industrial because and so that gets us back to oh and so one other thing too just to make sure you understand because looking at the materials from this company and their facility in California they mentioned the total destruction of PFAS, which if this were true, I would do backflips backflip, for you. I would learn how to do backflips and do them for you mm -hmm. because PFAS is so hard to destroy. This would be a problem solver. This would be on the front page if of this course. were true, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. The mm -hmm. second thing is they use the word sustainable a lot. Sustainable means a closed loop, right? Perfect sustainability is almost impossible to achieve. Sure. But this isn't even close because every pyrolysis facility that I've ever heard of, seen, reviewed, or my team has reviewed needs regular gas, fracked gas, to heat the sludge and, and dry it. Which has emissions. Which has emissions and is, it's not sustainable. That's right. not, not self-fueling. It needs a fossil fuel to come in. Right. And then it also needs a fossil fuel. You know, one of the, the one in uh, California says it gets to 19, uh, up to 1900 degrees. It needs right. a fossil fuel for that too. So this is not something where the burning of it will fuel the facility, not even close. So it's an energy and it's an also a climate thumbs down because you're going, anytime you're dealing with a carbon based material, you're creating carbon if you burn it. So that's, so this is a bad idea that way. And then finally, it takes your problem and, and suddenly Brockton is responsible for the region's problem. Right. Well, and that makes me nervous. Well, let's let's walk mm -hmm. that back just a yeah. minute because on May 16th at the finance committee meeting, mm -hmm. I I was not there. I I was ill. Mm -hmm. But one of my colleagues on the city council asked the question to the DPW commissioner, um, "Are you planning to take sludge from other communities and put it through this process once it's up and running in mm -hmm. Brockton?" And I understand that the, the DPW commissioner said, oh, not at that time, not at this time, you know, not at this time. So not at this time, I think everybody at home at this table understands that not at this time means not at this exact time. Who knows what happens? Right. It's that whole theory that I want to touch on um, 
we have to feed the beast. So once it's created, then the push. We don't, like, uh, as a grassroots activist, uh, such as myself, what I always see is they only tell you enough to get you to buy into one stage. And then once you get there, then it gets expanded. And as we stand here today, Brockton has, um, does process some other communities, um, wastewater treatment. Not a lot, mostly we do our own, but we have hooked in some of our surrounding towns for certain amounts, right? But those surrounding towns, when they get hooked in, I would have liked w only to hook them in for single family homes. Because then we know that a single family home poop yeah. and we're forcing the towns to build more so Brockton doesn't have to bear the burden of building all the housing. Um, but mostly the surrounding towns hook in their industrial parks. So that brings up your point of more chemicals being included. And if we were to build this $34 million burning facility, um, there would be a desire, I think, on the town's part to hook into that. And then there'd be more chemicals for us to breathe. And way back when I was a city councilor, I spoke with um, the city CFO and other officials of the city about the, the wastewater treatment plant and they really wanted to regionalize it. There was a study done, the study came down from the DEP saying it wasn't a good idea, but there are still people that want to do that. And when I spoke to them, I said, the, the bar for me is we can't be burning surrounding towns poop above our constituents' heads. That incinerator has to close. And then the incinerator closed. And I still stand firm in that. We can't be burning, paralysis, gasification, uh, of other people's poop over our constituents' heads. Well, you know that's right. And the, and the, here's the thing. Uh, and and I and I make this comment, loving everybody on the South Shore and every community. Duxbury is not considering this. Right. Okay. Um, it's sure. because and and I love Duxbury. I have family there. But uh, if you're a town that has a little bit more money, then you know it's a little easier to pay the bills and stay in the black. It's hard for any town or city. Yes. Uh, this is being considered because it looks good on paper when you give them when you give folks very little information but it's never going to take care of financial issues to the point like any regional landfill or regional incinerator that i've seen has never made a community wealthy or taken them to the point where they don't have money worries it's just made them all a little sicker um, and maybe filled in a few gaps, but it doesn't solve the money problem. It's not the kind of industry, it doesn't create a lot of jobs, it's really expensive. Uh, and, and as uh, the rep mentioned earlier, a lot of times these things fall apart because they're so expensive to run, because of that need for um, gas and all that other, you know, other work. It, it's expensive. It's an expensive technology that breaks down. So uh, again, this is not a good idea. Now, you, know, you need to know more about whether it is going to be regional or just serve the community. Obviously, that changes some of the analysis. But the reality here is that while sewage sludge is a difficult problem, this is the worst solution. But, you know, making, making this, so you, you breathe 24 seven. Right. I say it to people all the time. I am most concerned about air pollution. Yes. And PFAS is one of the nastiest chemicals that we've come across. Dioxin, one of the nastiest that we've come across. These are the chemicals that we have to be worried about here. So what do we do instead? I think that you hit the nail on the head. You look at what are the industrial inputs in this system, and you say, we need you to pre-treat before you send your stuff to Brockton. Uh, you start testing for these other contaminants, and you look at your facility and say, what do we need to start banning in the region, in the state, in this country to make sure that it's not in our sewage sludge. Because again, sewage sludge could be a safe land additive if we did our job regarding toxics, if we started regulating that. Do your job, like do, do, your job. do the full yeah, job. Do the Don't full do job. a part job, yeah. poison people, Preca and yeah. worry about it 10 years from now. Use the precautionary principle. We know the contaminants that are dangerous. Now that's a tall order. That's gonna take time, that's not easy. In the interim, what you wanna do is you want to uh, make sure that this sludge is dried so that you're, you know, you're getting the water off it as safely as possible. You want to make sure that your sludge, if you can process it before that with an anaerobic digester, which you may already be doing at the wastewater treatment plant to get the methane off of it, then you can, you know, then, then that's a good thing to do too. Uh, and again, 
Until such time as you figure out those larger solutions, shipping it to an existing incinerator, I'm not going to say that's great. I, I do worry about the folks in Connecticut too. It's not that you know, of you know, it's not that that's mm -hmm. a great solution. But if you build another incinerator, you do have to feed that beast. If you make, if you normalize this and pretend that this is a safe solution right. rather than a solution we should be phasing out because we should, you know, be looking at bigger and better solutions, um, you're just fooling yourself, and it is greenwashing. Thank Thank you. So let me say this, why did this come up and, and slap us in the face so quickly? Well, there, there's a lot of money at the state level for doing infrastructure projects and there is uh, money for water um, projects and so I guess this idea falls in, into that definition and so if the city were to approve it, I'm sorry, approve it by June 30th, mm -hmm then we could receive from the state revolving fund very favorable financing, incredibly favorable financing, mm -hmm. not only a low interest rate, but uh, forgiveness of principal. So borrowing $35 million, it may come down millions and millions of dollars without us having to pay it. And so I understand why a hard court press was put on to do it so quickly. But there was so much information that was left out, and that is what made me really nervous, really right. nervous. Right. I also come out of activism before I began a political career um, about a fossil fuel burning power plant, which was going to be next door to the wastewater treatment plant. And I got in quite deep, and it got really difficult, didn't you it? You did a great job, Susan. S as we were you. sued for $68 million for 10 years we personally, were. and we said we're we not were. going to back down, uh, and we're not going to back down on this either. Right. Yeah. right. So, uh, again, and you can see, we have to weigh what is best for our residents because this area bounds densely populated neighborhoods with what is best with, with uh, for the city to take care of this but not at the expense of poisoning people or putting PFAS. Now, um, on June 1st at my Ward 4 meeting, and people can watch that on YouTube, the Brockton channels, it was recorded by Brockton Community Access. One of the environmental engineers that came from CDM Smith talked about with PFAS, you have to heat it up high enough that you can break down the molecules. But as you've just touched, it's not perfect solution. It's not real. It, 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 I wish that it were, and yes. um, and if we had evidence that it were, uh, that would be one thing. But we don't. Uh, you know, the EPA is looking into it. They're trying to figure out, you know, what temperature it might break down, mm -hmm. and they're also trying to figure out how long it would have to be in the chamber. And that's the other thing that concerns me, because what we see with incinerators across the country is that they don't do constant emissions monitoring on most contaminants. Right. They don't do mercury constantly. They don't do dioxin constantly. You know, these different con contaminants like PFAS that we're concerned about, um, they test them every once in a while, and then if they don't like the test, they do it over again. You know, so our regulatory structure, even if, um, even if there were evidence that this could be safe, I worry that our um, agencies are not strong enough and well staffed enough to make it safe. So I have layers of worries on this. Sure. If, if you're going to do a water project um, in Brockton, for instance, one thing would be great is to have less water going into your wastewater treatment plant. Mm -hmm. so on the front end. On the front end. That mm -hmm. would save you a lot of money. Ah, yes. So one way to do that is to you know, look at who your large water users are and try and get them to recirculate. You know, that's one issue. Mm -hmm. The other thing is permeability. And this, again, is a money thing that the state should be able to help you out with. There are a lot of ways to build a parking lot or a road or a sidewalk to make sure that the water can go back into the ground. Right. And then that storm water, which is what bulks up all of your, um, you know, that volume. Because the problem with a landfill or an incinerator or wastewater treatment plant is two things. The toxics, but then also just a huge mass of material, right? Water and waste and everything sure. else. If you decrease what you're dealing with, it makes it easier to handle the toxics and all those other pieces too. So, and just cheaper. So if you can, for instance, if you got a landfill, if you can get the food out of there, boom, you've just reduced everything by 25%. Right. If you can get the storm water out of your wastewater treatment plant, or at least some of it, that water would go back into the ground. That's better for the environment. That's better for your cost. Like that's one way of doing this. Nice. And then I also like your idea too of looking very 
critically at the industrial inputs. Who, you know, if your land, the, the, uh, pre-treatment at your landfill means that that leachate won't have the PFAS in it possibly, or at mm -hmm. least that's the hope. You know, it makes it better right. at least. Right. So there are different ways to spend that money that's coming down from the state. And um, it, so I just, well, we're going to wrap up, ladies. So thank you for being here. Um, I, I'm going to open it up to you to say goodbye as well. But um, my name is Michelle Dubois. I'm happy to be your state rep. And I want you to know that this is going to be an ongoing education for all of us, us, Susan and I, as well as you at home, the city of Brockton. We're going to uh, be asking uh, Kirsty Pet Petchy to come on down and to help us some more and get other people to come out for more educational um, aspects on this and then to maybe build um, a citizen team of people that understand this. Like at your meeting there was a gentleman that retired from MWRA who is very knowledgeable mm. and he thinks that there are other solutions as well oh, and he was very concerned about this choice. So I want to I want to publicly thank Mayor, Carp Mayor Sullivan. Goodness. Thank you so much Mayor Sullivan for putting an end to this. This project started before his time under Mayor Carpenter which is why I, I almost missed up the name. This is not um, a Bob Sullivan project. So he's put an end to it. I want to thank him for that. And we're going to work to make sure that it doesn't get revived. So everybody at home doesn't get fooled by the propaganda of the industry that tries to tell us that this is the solution. So it's been really great having being here with you. And if Susan or Kirsty would like to close out, we can, we can say goodbye. You go next, I'll go last. Okay, that sounds great, Counselor. So thank you very much, Counselor, and thank, thank you. you, Representative, for your time. I really appreciate this. I wouldn't know about this happening if you folks hadn't contacted me and mm -hmm. keep me in the loop, so that, that's fantastic. Um, I've never seen a high heat pyrolysis gasification or, or standard mass burn incinerator that wasn't expensive, that wasn't polluting, that was sustainable. None of them are sustainable. They all need some kind of exter external uh, fossil fuels to run. Uh, none of them create good jobs, none of them protect air, water, and the ash is always toxic and you've got to find some place to landfill it. Uh, and uh, this, they're only suggested in environmental justice communities, places where there are more people of color, places where people have a little less money, because they're hoping that they can pull one over on you. So I'm really glad to hear that people are concerned about this and asking the right questions. And as we have more information, we'll be able to hopefully help find more solutions because I want Brockton to get that pot of money for other good things Absolutely. that you could be doing with your water and, you know, and, your, and your systems. Mm -hmm. thank you. So thank you so much for having me. This is a continuing challenge because we do have to find a way to deal with our sludge. So I'm looking for the best and the brightest of Brockton, as Rep Dubois mentioned. I had several people who are in this industry or in these areas and know a lot more at my meeting on June 1st. We took down their contact information and, and we just need citizen input and, and caring citizens to come and help us. So you can call me with, that, with your contact information if you want to get involved. My number is 508-897-1314. You can email me snicastro at cobma.us or you can contact Rep. Dubois, who will give you her information. Yes, yeah, so my, my, my cell phone is 774-274-1344, and my email is Michelle with two L's, a period, D-U-B-O-I-S, at mahouse.gov. And I want to thank you all for participating in this first Good Government with Michelle Dubois episode since uh, COVID and it's going to be a monthly thing and thank you all for watching at home.